Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, it's great to have all of you here today on this beautiful day. I mean, one, really one of the most beautiful days we've had in New Haven, weather-wise, for a long time, and here you are indoors. Um, thanks to your dedication to the work that you're gonna talk about today and hear others describe. Um, I'm Steve Pitty, I'm faculty in American Studies and ERNM and History, um, and the director of the RITM Center. Um, and we've been looking forward to this event um, for a long time. Uh, we were looking for an opportunity to um, uh, see you all in action, to see people present about their work, and you know, just as importantly, maybe more importantly, um, give people the opportunity to hear from one another, because I think one of the things that this place doesn't do as well as it might is um, give folks the opportunity to engage with one another about their work in progress, about their research in progress. Um, too often all of us are sort of um, dug into our own projects, stuck in our own holes, digging, 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 and we may not know um, who's digging what just a few feet uh, away from us. So here we have that opportunity, right, to, to learn from one another, to think collaboratively, um, uh, to think across uh, disciplines, all more or less around topics related to questions surrounding race, indigeneity, transnational migration, um, and similar things. So last year here in the RITM Center, uh, we had the opportunity, the extraordinary opportunity, to support um, uh, research work by undergraduates, graduate students, and professional students around campus. Uh, a total of 52 um, students from all categories received some form of support from us. And we're really, really fortunate and proud that we were able to support students from so many um, different parts of the university, from 17 different uh, departments, programs, um, and divisions of the university, uh, both in this part of campus, Central Campus, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, Yale College, the Yale Graduate School, but also extending out to the medical school, the nursing school, the art school, architecture, divinity, uh, uh, forestry and environmental studies, um, and so forth. Um, so this is what our part of our mandate is here in RITM, is to try to uh, nurture and enable that work in all parts where we can uh, help, and then to bring that work together in one place as best we can uh, to make sure that uh, you all can hear from one another. So we're excited about the opportunity today um, to bring that work uh, together, to give you the chance to, to present uh, and to hear from one another about the work that you've done. Uh, and to make this space available to, uh, uh, to enable uh, collaboration and elaboration uh, in the, the hour or so to come. So what we have today is a subset, um, a, a fraction of the work that um, uh, uh, happened um, <laughs> over the summer. Um, I think 12 presentations. Uh, and we thank all of you for being here today, uh, for, for answering the call and um, as summer awardees um, to come and share your work with one another. Thanks so much. Um, what we're gonna ask everybody to do is to speak for no more than three minutes um, about their work. Uh, we have put together a program uh, and the, uh, the PowerPoint presentations are already in order, so they will load automatically and that, that should make this uh, easier for everybody. Um, as you can see, I'm holding a microphone. Uh, we'd ask you to also hold the microphone so we can catch this um, on tape. Um, and uh, make sure that this is um, recorded well. Um, we'll let you know when you have a minute left and then when your time is up. So we hope that you'll you know, uh, enjoy this, settle in, <laughs> have fun uh, with this, but also um, stick to time. Hi, my name is Amber Drumgool. I'm in the departments of Religious Studies and African American Studies. Oh, there we go, okay. This summer, while presenting my research on 20th century gospel composer Roxanne Moore at the biannual Christian Congregational Music Conference in Oxford, England, I had the opportunity to converse and fellowship with a group of scholars researching black sacred music traditions spanning the Atlantic. These discussions opened the door for sustained global conversation and collaboration concerning the nature of black sound, consciousness, and self-making. From United States 20th century great migration narratives and the lasting impact of black southern migrants to northern cities on black expressive culture, to the onset and effect of the mid 20th century wind rush movement of Caribbean and West African populations, creating a multifaceted black British community, negotiating collective significance against nuanced cultural offerings and traditions, the dialogue was incredibly dynamic. 
This to say, in addition to my own research concerning the creation, evolution, and innovation of black musical production and sound as analyzed and described through the life of Roxy Ann Moore, I was able to add this transatlantic component to which she was also a contributor and beneficiary to my research, which was a direct result of my travels and rhythm support. While my initial work this summer was supposed to follow the trails of Roxy Ann Moore and legendary 20th century vocal group, the Golden Kid Quartet, I found my work taking different turns as a result of robust conversation held with my black British colleagues. For example, Letters I found in Roxer's archive prior to my travels informed me of how the Gates first arrived in Paris in the mid-1950s to explore new economic opportunities after their light began to dim the United States and music labels started casting them aside for seemingly brighter stars. I knew the black Americans in the mid-20th century viewed Paris as a place of freedom and liberation from the economic and racial turmoil of the United States, and that the ambassadorship of jazz artists opened a window for other black musical artists and groups like the Golden Gate Quartet to find audiences in Europe. But through this summer's research, I learned that Windrush, the mass migration of West Indian and West African migrants to Europe from the mid to late 20th century, coincided with these efforts, adding several other dimensions to an ever-evolving black European soundscape. During the Christian Congregational Music Conference, I learned of Trinibagodian folk songs that migrants brought with them, songs combined with the sounds of a burgeoning gospel music industry. Scholars observed how the commercialization and commodification of black American sacred music practices affected Caribbean and West African artistic retentions as they sought to adapt to new landscapes while keeping home near. Discussions surrounding the Americanization of dialect and pronunciation when recording music came up time and time again. This experience has shifted my research in a new and dynamic directions, and I am grateful to Rhythm for allowing me the opportunity to open such a necessary dialogue. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Johnson. I am a second year in history and African American studies. Um, so my research looked at the civil rights movement, generally it looks at civil rights movements in places outside of the South. So I start with the Great Migration, starting around 1916 when black folks were moving from the South up to northern industrial cities. And from there I look at how those same black folks in cities took their southern roots, took what was happening in the South, and made the civil rights movement their own. So as black southerners moved into to Chicago specifically, they set about rebuilding and creating new institutions. These included churches and schools, as well as branches of organizations like the NAACP and Congress of Racial Equality. Early on in the civil rights era, many of these groups were strategically made interracial, which is how I found myself, kind of unexpectedly, looking at the papers of Faith Rich, a white woman who worked as an unpaid staffer for the Chicago NAACP beginning in 1945 and working all the way until she passed away in the 1990s. Um, in her more than 50 years living in a black neighborhood on the west side of Chicago, she involved herself in nearly every ed education-related battle for equality, as well as political struggle struggles over urban renewal policies. Though much of her work was created, was working on creating research for reports, um, she was also not afraid of door-to-door -door organizing, doing a lot of block work, or block-based organizing work. Um, Chicago civil rights movements were in some ways very similar to movements in the South. Much of the organizing started with desegregating restaurants and roller rinks, um, but then went on to schools and eventually housing, and then eventually a lot of black power-ish movements working on black business. Um, these individual movements, sort of broken down issue by issue, were also happening all at once throughout time and ended up being continued over the period starting around 1916 to 1970. So while you can break them down issue by issue, they also were concurrent throughout. Um, in one of the most dramatic moments in 1963, 200,000 public school students stayed home from school to protest inequality in public education. Three years later, before the schools came to re a resolution, Martin Luther King moved into the city to fight for open housing. Local people on the ground juggled these shifting priorities as focus changed over time. The majority of my sources up to this point, doing research for a couple years, um, were not personal in nature. So I looked at a lot of reports created by community organizations, internal memos, draft of, drafts of speeches, things like that. But this was one of the first archives that I came across that had letters back and forth to husband and wife, for example. And I had to figure out what to make of that. It's a different type of source. I had never come across it. What do you do? Um, and I found that actually it was really helpful in piecing together what the role of a white woman in a black activist position 
um, meant and how she felt about it and how she took it on and how her neighbors felt about it and how her family felt about it. So it really shifted my focus on my research into not only black folks organizing about issues that affected them, but also the ways that coalition was working in the city of Chicago in this period. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heidi. I'm a senior history major here at Yale. This summer I was fortunate to receive funding from the RITM Center to visit a, a series of archives in the Midwest. In particular, I was investigating the relationship between the entangled relationship between railroad expansion and the White Earth and Red Lake reservations in northwestern Minnesota in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. What I found increasingly in my research by looking at Indian ancient correspondence and diaries and maps and transcribed oral histories was how much um, railroads really affected both reservation policies and um, Euro-American uh, settlers' access to these lands. So in 1889, the Nelson Act was established in Minnesota that basically granted settlers, Euro-American settlers, access um, and settlement upon both the White Earth and Red Lake reservations and also allowed timber tycoons to access these reservations. So I started looking at maps, for example, from 1887 that showed a transcontinental railroad passing just south of the reservation and all the lands in orange represent lands that were available for sale. This reveals the degree of pressure that railroads applied on these reservations and therefore allowed um, for settlement on the reservations. Likewise, only 15 years later, we see the effect of regional railroads and the presence of railroads on the reservations. So the, this railroad, the Sioux Line, passed right through the heart of White Earth and just skirted Red Lake. That allowed timber tycoons and land speculators to gain access to the land, which in turn allowed for um, the denuding of the landscape and white settlers to basically take over these reservations. The effects of these rail, this railroad expansion um, was just devastating for the native populations. Here we see an Ojibwe woman practicing her traditional maple sugaring. Um, and likewise, other practices such as wild ricing became very endangered because of the intensive logging practices that were occurring um, because of the railroad expansion. And so we see basically that how how greatly railroads are implicated in this process of um, environmental degradation, land dispossession, and the cultural practices um, that suffered thereafter. And so I was just super fortunate to engage with a series of photographs, such as the one with uh, Roland Reed here, um, and all these different maps and Indian Asian correspondence that just shed light on this story that's otherwise been somewhat neglected in the, histor in the historiography of the period. Most people have focused on um, just the policies themselves instead of the vehicles that allowed these policies to be enacted. So thank you. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline Lee. I'm a third year history PhD student studying Latin American history. Um, and this summer I went to London for my research, thanks to money from RITM. So my research is on the Bay of Honduras and the Mosquito Shore in the 18th century. Um, so the Bay of Honduras occupied the region that is today Belize. You'll see it in yellow on the map labeled British Honduras. And the Mosquito Shore occupied the Caribbean coast of modern day southern Honduras and Nicaragua. So it comes down the pink and green here on the right side of the screen. So the significance of the time and place come into play in the context of early modern Atlantic empires. Here specifically, we're dealing with Britain and Spain, and Spain by right of discovery and the authority of the Papal Bull of 1493 claimed absolute sovereignty over the entire expanse of the Americas west of the line drawn um, in the Treaty of Tordesillas. So of course, this is how it worked in theory, but in reality, Spain didn't have the manpower and the Spanish authorities on the ground didn't have the inclination to completely explore and take a hold of the territory in all of Spanish America. And especially on this Caribbean coast of New Spain, the terrain was jungle filled and the coastline was treacherous. And so Europeans really made few entries into this region. The British eventually came to get a foothold here um, in the bay in particular, in the yellow area. Um, and as the historiographic myth goes, in the golden age of buccaneering, as it comes to an end, the buccaneers who would have been among the best sailors of this region um, 
would have been able to navigate the treacherous keys and reefs coming into the bay. So you can see the map um, of the water as it moves around these islands. It would have been really hard to actually access the land mass um, of this coast of Central America. Um, so as Jamaica changes hands from Spain to Britain um, in the late 17th century and sugar planters are beginning to establish their lucrative businesses here, um, the European powers agreed that buccaneering needed to come to an end in this new age of order in the Caribbean. So as a result, the buccaneers who had been operating in the Caribbean sought new sources of income, and they turned to enterprises they had already been starting, which were cutting logwood and ma mahogany from this region. So as these trades expand, um, Spain and Britain began to vie for sovereignty over the region, and the traditional story that's told of this is about an Anglo-Spanish conflict. So my question in researching this has been challenging the historiography to look at other sides that are not simply about European sovereignty, and specifically about the Mosquito Indians who actually held territorial, political, um, and political control of this region. Um, and a geographer, Carl, often writes that this region was only called Mosquito or the Mosquito Shore um, because of the mosquito spatial practices. Otherwise, it would have only been some other place in Central America. Um, so my research looks at how the Mosquito Indians were not only crucial in facilitating European forays into the region, but also I'd like to take seriously the words themselves. So for example, why has sovereignty not been used in the historiography of this region, um, and how can we apply that, taking into account um, contemporary challenges that the Mosquito people still face with the Nicaraguan government, um, and questioning the ethics and how far we can actually push the history and questions in this region. So that's my work. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ever Osorio. I'm a third year in American Studies and Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. And this summer, I had the opportunity to do archival research, which is, so, which is something that I've never done before. So I want to thank Steve for uh, gently pushing me in the last two years to go beyond my methods and improve them. So uh, I guess that one of the gains was like to not be scared anymore of the archive. And I think that's like a big, big steps, so I had the opportunity to get there, make friends with the archival people, uh, and get to know materials, how to do research, how is the ar archive organized, so I kind of learned that. And my question was, well, what is the global circulation of contemporary art on the war on drugs? And why global circulation? Because I wanted to see how there were different interpretations of the Mexican war on drugs, which is my main area of research, in as aesthetics, as how we are feeling this violence from a global perspective. So I went to four archives. The first one was in MUAC, which is the Museo Universitario de Arte Contemporáneo, which is a university museum of UNAM, which is the main uh, public national university in Mexico. And there what I found was fascinating because um, I found the embroiderers, which were women that, uh, inter that embroidered the name of uh, victims of the war on drugs, of casualties. So it was very interesting to see how I, for, I had forgotten about that. Like I had forgotten about all those visual artistic manifestations that have been taking place in the last 10 years. So that was like, in a way this research was also like self autographic because I found like a lot of stuff that I had forgotten. And like what was forgotten was for sure like one of the most important elements of this historical record. Uh, then I went to uh, Paris to the Saint Pompidou. I found nothing. So, like, but that absence is important because it really speaks of the circulation of art and like the geographical uh, distribution of certain topics or concerns. Then I went to Kassel in Germany, where Documenta, one of the most important contemporary art fairs, takes place every five years. And there, what I found were like more. Since I'm not looking for history or like a particular historiography, I am mostly looking for metaphors or like, I don't like the word sign, but like symbols that let me think beyond what, I, what I'm already thinking. So I found a lot of metaphors there. And finally, I was in Venice, uh, in where the Biennale, the Venice Biennale, which is like the oldest contemporary art fair, takes place. And this is the work of Teresa Margolles, one of the most uh, relevant contemporary Mexican artists. And the name of this art piece is The Search. And it's relevant because it shows uh, like posters of the government as looking or searching for women that are missing. And what is like so sadly and painful is that 
these are like from 2009, 2011. So when we see the massive demonstra demonstrations of women in the like in our hemisphere, we can see like how old that phenomenon is. So that's what I found. Uh, hello, my name is Hector Peralta, and I'm a third year PhD student in American Studies. Today, our public schools in the US are as segregated as they were when the Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education. What's more, states like New York and California are among the most segregated of those states. But how did we get here? Well, by the 1980s, Constitutionally mandated integration of schools had been largely undermined through legislation like California's Prop 21, which prohibited mandatory busing. Today, schools continue to contend with the effects of white flight, redistricting, and the rise in private and charter school enrollment. Yet, state-funded school programs working to improve graduation rates and increase access to higher education largely ignore the realities of inequity produced through school segregation. One such program is AVID, which stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. In 1980, a high school English teacher named Mary Catherine Swanson founded the AVID program at a public high school in San Diego County. As schools restructured to accommodate for changes in student demographics and budget capacity caused by factors like refugee, refugee resettlement and the privatization of education, AVID was advertised as a remedy an educational innovation to close the achievement gap. Today AVID, is offer, today, AVID is offered in 47 states and 16 countries worldwide. In popular coverage, Swanson is celebrated as a visionary educator with a plan and the gall to disseminate it. Yet these very accounts celebrate her individual grit and tenacity without emphasizing the collective of mentors, educators, and administrators that make AVID as successful as it is. Even the name, Advancement Via Individual Determination, pushes forward a neoliberal vision of public education. It is up to the individual student determination if they go to college. So my research asks, how is the resegregation of schools and the unequal distribution of resources rendered invisible behind programs like AVID? Furthermore, how is the AVID pedagogy implemented in other education programs designed for indigenous and migrant communities within the San Diego region? With the support of RIDM, I conducted archival and ethnographic research this summer to examine how different educational institutions in San Diego address the achievement gap in schools. Primarily, I worked at the Viejas Tribal Education Center, or VTEC, located on the Viejas Kumeyaay Reservation in East County, San Diego. VTEC provides after-school tutoring, college readiness, and life management skills workshops um, for students who are uh, children of enrolled tri tribal members. In an oral history I conducted with uh, Teresa, the high school student coordinator at VTEC, she stated the greatest need within the public school district is tutoring services for all students, not just those in AVID or those um, at part of VTEC. Looking forward, I will analyze how collaborative mentorship functions differently across AVID, VTEC, and YALA, which is a nonprofit that uses a combination of after school tutoring and team soccer to prepare migrant students to enter college. As San Diego County continues to lead in refugee resettlement, I hope my research will support and promote pedagogies of and for liberation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tiana Reed. I am a joint PhD student in history and African American studies. Um, if I ask everyone to take out some money right now, you might pull out a dollar bill, a coin, or even a debit or credit card. Um, it wouldn't be difficult for many of us in the room right now. But there was a time in the early modern period where money was not standard, and if I ask the same question in the 17th or 18th century, you might pull out a Spanish piece of eight, a French livre, English or Dutch bills of exchange, and you could all be in uh, the same British colony. Um, for my research, I am exploring, I am connecting this early modern history of the complicated monetary supply with the rented out labor and Sunday markets of Africans and their descendants. Um, particularly, I am exploring the economic activities of freed and enslaved people of color in Barbados, Jamaica, and South Carolina from 1650 to 1770. 
I'm tracing their sources of income, um, the economies they participated in, and how their lives too were affected by the early modern monetary supply, wondering how they paid for um, their manumission, wondering how they paid for rent, for clothes, for food. Through my analysis of the money of freed and enslaved people of color, I hope to provide an early modern basis for thinking about economic inequality, not only in terms of the difference for how much money people have, but also in the difference in the types of money that people have access to. And finally, I hope to create an interdisciplinary dialogue between the fields of history, uh, finance, and black studies. To complete my project, um, this summer, with the support of RITM, I went to the British National Archives where I explored several um, colonial office records. In particular, I'll name two, the Colonial Office Records 2815, um, which contains several letters about the illicit trade between uh, Barbados and the French, and then Colonial Office Records uh, 137-2 that contain similar documents with relation to Jamaica's uh, illicit trade with the Spanish. Um, collectively, what these documents show is that um, doo, 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 um, whether or not, um, sorry, one second. Uh, primarily, I would argue from these sources that the support for piracy um, that went on sometimes under the table by these colonial governors shows that there was a desperation for money in the colonies and that it, there was a definite means to procure money through illicit trade. And with further research, I'm going to show that the currency um, from this trade ended up in the hands of freed and enslaved people and was important to their survival in these colonial spaces. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gabriela Rivera. I'm Mapuche, I'm a senior ER and I'm major, I'm an undergrad. And I'm using images of street art in Chile around Santiago and Temuco that I collected this past summer um, to look at indigenous Mapuche urban identities and resistance today against state sanctioned violences directed against indigenous communities in Chile. And one question that I ask is to what extent are these artworks examples of manifestations of Mapuche resistance? Because urban spaces are oftentimes not seen as spaces inhabited by indigenous peoples, and therefore this becomes indigenous space reclamation. Um, they can be self-erected memorials to victims of police brutality, like Matias Catrileo, who was murdered by a police officer. They can address hydroelectric company encroachment on Mapuche lands, the desecration of burial sites, or current Mapuche political prisoners like Francisca Linconao, who was arrested under Chile's anti-terrorism law because the state oftentimes perceives Mapuche people as terrorists. Linconao is currently still in prison for her resistance. I also ask, to what extent do some of these murals in the heart of Santiago point to an issue of multiculturalism in the Chilean state? Or the concept of promoting diversity politics in a country oftentimes while still maintaining discriminatory policies towards specific racial and ethnic groups? In Chile, one of the tenets that allows the multicultural state to function is the concept of mestizaje, which is typically defined as um, the mixing of white Spanish or colonizer blood with indigenous blood to produce a quote unquote new race or the mestizo. And I'm going to refer to it as an ideology in an engagement with Mapuche poet um, Daniela Catrileo's work. Um, she refers to mestizaje as a colonizer ideology which promotes the assimilation of indigenous peoples into white society. And this further supports the settler state by promoting a diminishing of indigenous communities through a pattern of self-identification with whiteness. And it creates a racial hierarchy with the quote unquote actually indigenous peoples at the bottom and then mestizos and whiteness on the top. Um, many mestizos claim native heritage or ancestry which relegates our indigeneity to the past as belonging to history rather than as an active part of ourselves today and promotes stereotypes such as vanishing native people and that indigenous peoples are disappearing. Mestizos in Chilean society are oftentimes the one enacting violence against Mapuche people and enacting the violence on indigenous communities that they perceive themselves to no longer be a part of. The street art in Chile gets at complex layerings of identities and of the presence of a white settler state and ultimately I'm going to draw parallels between Chilean street art and settler state violences to transnational settler state violences pro protested by indigenous produced murals in neighborhoods of color that I've also collected in Baltimore and Washington DC. Um, like murals containing images of Freddie Gray or Trayvon Martin, and I want to draw attention to a, a variety of human rights violations and injustices that settler states legally and systemically perpetuate that we continue to confront today. Marichiweo, cien veces venceremos. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Sylvia Ryerson. I'm a second year American Studies PhD. And um, the RITM Summer Research Fellowship um, supported 10 weeks of field research for me in, um, in Eastern Kentucky um, on mass incarceration in Central Appalachia. Since the 1990s, Central Appalachia has become one of the most concentrated areas of rural prison growth nationwide. And many of these new prisons are built on formerly um, strip mined mountaintop removal mined land. And so my initial research goal was to document transfers of land ownership from coal companies to prison sites. Um, however, within my weeks of first arriving in Kentucky this summer, um, one of my research sites, there was major news um, that broke regarding the pending construction of a new federal prison in Letcher County, K Kentucky. Um, and this is the prison proposal um, that was first proposed to the county in 2008. And um, on June 20th, the Federal Bureau of Prisons withdrew its record of decision to build USP Letcher, which was projected to become a $510 million new high security prison. Um, this effectively defeated what was slated to become the most expensive federal prison ever built in US history. So due to this historic turn of events, I, um, my research took a different direction. And I focused on the 15 years of local and national organizing that made the defeat of this prison possible. And um, you can see this is the proposed site. Um, and this is a strip mine. And I interviewed um, many different people, including some local landowners. And so um, here is one of my interviews. And they were going to try to split her right across the top of his land. And they could have bullied him. They could have said, look, that's our coal. Yeah. The best way to get to it is right across your land. This has already been signed over to us. But uh, I think from what I can tell, they, they were forced to go another way. And, and they did. They went up the road about a half mile. And they made a winding road to go up the top of that. And all of that coal was brought off another way. But they wanted to come off Grandpa's side. And had it not been for that, you, you've got to right. You know, they, they kept, and it would have busted my, uh, right down through my grandfather's big uh, cow pastures where he kept his cattle and stuff. It would have, you know, just been an awful mess there it was. He wouldn't have been able to use it. You know, it would have took up half of his land. And it, it would have been terrible to have seen it split down there. And, that, and that's what I thought was going to happen again. Really, really was. That's what I thought was going to happen again. That's Mitch Whitaker, who owned 15 acres of the 700-acre site, located his opposition to the prison within the genealogy of organizing that his grandfather and his father were part of that um, was opposing um, radical strip mining in the 1970s. So that's what you heard him talking about. And um, he, his refusal to sell these 15 acres um, delayed um, the whole project two years and was pivotal in um, ultimately defeating this proposal. And he ended up joining a historic lawsuit alongside 21 incarcerated people across the country that sued the federal government against the prison being constructed on the grounds that it would cause unnecessary harm. So this research is central to a journal article I'm currently co-authoring, um, observing what this ROD record of decision withdrawal reveals about the current contradictions of the US carceral state and how a multi-sided coalition of organizers, advocates, and landowners strategically exploited these contradictions and created the space for radical and groundbreaking opposition to the carceral state to emerge in a place many might not have expected or thought possible. Hi everyone, my name is Anshul Saraf and I'm a third year in American Studies and WGSS. This summer I did a combination of ethnographic and archival work in order to consider the history of indigenous anti-nuclear organizing in the Pacific through an organization known as a nuclear free and independent Pacific movement. So the poster that is on this poster right here as well as the two photographs above are both um, historical photos from NFIP mobilization. I also considered the material traces left on Pacific Islanders subject to nuclear detonations, whose landscapes and displacement point to the still present nature of 20th century wars in the Pacific. The aerial photo of Majuro Atoll in the Marshall Islands depicts the ethnographic space in which I began to ask the latter question more intently. And I took that photo from the plane window. Um, for my research, I visited the National Archives of Australia in Canberra and the National Archives of Aotearoa, or New Zealand, in Wellington, as well as the archives at UH Manoa in Honolulu, Hawaii. I also did preliminary fieldwork in Majuro in the Marshall Islands. I have a few primary takeaways from this experience. 
First, the politics of the archive are deeply enmeshed with empire's entanglements within climate change, as many documents formerly available in the marshals were lost due to disaster events or moved to imperial archives due to sea level rise. Second, the Black Pacific is a generative terrain of contestation within 20th century social movements in Oceania, especially in the ways it troubles divides between blackness and indigeneity in order to provide a fulcrum for solidarity. And that's me, I think, riffing on Manu Karuka's um, uh, ideas of fulcrums for solidarity. Third, war is immediate in the marshals. It happened, it is happening, it could happen at any given moment. These coexisting temporalities remind me that as I imagine liberatory Pacific Islander futures, I must also account for the colonial and settler, settler futures already set in motion by the artifacts of war, such as unexploded ordinances, human bones in various stages of repatriation or loss, and American military ships rusting in the fishing lagoon, parts breaking off and breaching sand where children play. Finally, Pacific Islander women and queer people are and have been at the helm of these trans-indigenous movements. The sovereignty of their bodies is a critical foundation to further liberation. While these are just a handful of the revelations I had doing research this summer, they speak to a much larger examination of nuclear colonialism and indigenous resistance, as well as the transformations of race that emerge from the migration catalyzed by these unfolding processes. I thank Ridham for funding this work. It has proven to be an extraordinarily enriching summer. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Monique. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of History. So, two photo albums sit side by side in the archives at UC Berkeley. One of them, filled with mug shots replicated from a long lost set of original photographs in the early 20th century. Under each mug shot, detailed descriptions of what the men wore, their hairstyles, and other information that according to the eyes of a Mexican anthropologist and his research assistant, told us just what type of Mexican men these were. Another, filled with photographs just like this one, of men standing in a field with either cows, cars, or horses in the background, and little to no information about them, beyond that they're from the late 1920s and perhaps a name and a hometown. In another archive on the other side of the Bay Area sit a different set of records. Mexicans entering the US through Angel Island whose names, birthdays, kinship networks, jobs, enter the historical record through immigration workers and are found actually in national archives of Chinese exclusion. All of these archives are part of how Mexican migrants from the middle class escaping the Mexican Revolution to migrant peasant workers um, laboring during the Great Depression in agricultural fields in the US enter the historical record, shepherded in by how a set of experts or so-called experts understood them. Anthropologists, economists, INS workers, the border patrol, Photographers and bureaucrats of all sorts on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border from 1910 to mid-century were heavily concerned with Mexicans entering the U.S., but also of what type of Mexicans were entering, of how to racially categorize them, of how to understand and read what they are um, according to so-called experts, and what they saw in their faces, clothing, and hairstyles. This is a story made up of different threads of how different experts were establishing and solidifying the racial category of Mexican in the US at the same time that Mexican experts were solidifying a national, almost mythical mestizo Mexican citizen after the Mexican Revolution. Both were taking place in relation to massive migrations of Mexicans within Mexico and in the US. And they specifically were concerned with how one saw them. What did their clothes tell these experts about economic station? What did their hairstyles tell them about their racial locations, about their gender presentation, and about who they were? In short, what did one see when looking at a Mexican? These are questions that enter the archive along with the photographs and textual records that these experts have used to try to figure out who these Mexicans were, how they fit into the racial matrix of both the US and Mexico, and how citizenship was being fashioned on each side of the border, but also between them, dependent on what one saw when looking at a Mexican. This is the project that I've taken on for my dissertation and that has slowly come together in no small part thanks to the generous funding and support of RITM over the last summer, allowing me to visit these archives, sit with the stories of these migrants, and to begin to figure out what it is that I see. Thank you.
All right, uh, I'm Adam Waters. I'm a second year history PhD student. Um, and first of all, it's just really wonderful to be able to share my work alongside all of you. So thanks for that. Um, so on March 24th, 1982, a rally was held at Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, Arizona to declare, declare publicly that the church would provide shelter to migrants fleeing systemic violence in Central America. Over the next several years, hundreds of churches, synagogues, mosques, and other religious communities joined the sanctuary movement in supporting migrants and protesting the Reagan administration's policy towards Central America. Likewise, a constellation of committees and organizations were birthed to shepherd the movement at the local, regional, and national levels. And as is common with political movements, especially those on the left, numerous and often serious disagreements emerged over, among other things, the political orientation of sanctuary and the role of Central American migrants themselves in the movement. So the sanctuary movement was a subject of intense media coverage and a good deal of scholarly research in its time. But given where we, where we find ourselves today with renewed conversations about migration from Central America, about migrant detention and deportation regimes, uh, and with the emergence of a new sanctuary movement, I think it's an opportune moment to revisit the 1980s sanctuary movement. So this summer, I spent a month in Tucson conducting initial research on the sanctuary movement and its historical legacies. My research was primarily archival, exploring several sanctuary-related collections at the University of Arizona. But I also had the opportunity to get involved with local organizations currently working in humanitarian assistance and advocacy for migrants, many of which were created and staffed and uh, sustained by former sanctuary workers. My time in the archives and my conversations with migrant justice activists have sparked a number of questions that I hope to consider moving forward. And so I'll outline just a few conclusions for my summer and avenues for further research. So first, most works on sanctuary have either focused on a local level and its manifestations in a particular city, in Tucson, in, in uh, Los Angeles, in San Francisco, or on the actions of its national leadership. But the documents that I found make clear that the sanctuary movement needs to be approached as a multi-scalar phenomenon. I hope to document the relationships and the dynamics between actors at various scales in order to present a more comprehensive sense of how the movement operated as a whole. My research this summer also made clear that the sanctuary movement was a transnational and international movement. So Tucson-based activists were working closely with church leaders in, in Central America and in Mexico to develop what they called an underground railroad that brought migrants through Mexico, across the US-Mexico border, and into sanctuary in the United States. So far, no one has really been able to document how this, uh, this trail actually functioned, particularly how it functioned outside of the borders of the United States. And so I imagine that my work in the future will involve conducting fieldwork in northern Guatemala and in Mexico. And finally, I think there's a lot more to be done to think about how the sanctuary movement fits into larger histories of immigration policy, migrant justice activism, left politics, and progressive religion in the late 20th century uh, in the United States and in, the Amer in Latin America. I'm particularly interested in situating sanctuary as part of an emerging migrant justice praxis, one that stretches from the 1970s through to the present. Thanks.